ayahuasca itself is not an Amazonian word. It, it comes from the Quechua language, and it means the vine of souls or the vine of the dead. Uh, but the ayahuasca vine is only one of two principal ingredients in the ayahuasca brew. And the other ingredient are leaves that contain dimethyltryptamine. And there are two sources of that. One is a bush called Cicotria viridis. That's its botanical name. They call it Chacruna in the Amazon. And its leaves are rich in dimethyltryptamine DMT, which is arguably the most powerful psychedelic uh, known to science. Um, and and uh, the other source comes from another vine, Diplopteris cabrerana, uh, which the leaves of that vine also contain DMT. So the ayahuasca vine on its own is not going to give you a visionary journey. And the leaves that contain DMT on their own, whether they come from Diplopteris or whether they come from Chacruna, are not going to give you a visionary journey. And the reason they're not going to give you the visionary journey is because of the enzyme monoamine oxidase in the gut that shuts down DMT when absorbed orally. Basically, DMT is not accessible orally unless you combine it with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And that's what I mean when I'm talking about science in the Amazon, because there's so many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands different species of plants and trees in the Amazon, and they've gone around and they've found just two or three of them that put together can produce these extraordinary visionary experiences. Just imagine the number of plants they had to have eaten. Yeah. It consumed and smoked, or mm. all kinds of combinations to arrive at that. Exactly, exactly. To realize that this is something this is something very special and then and then to use the principles there to to find another form of it. So ayahuasca is the form that is made with the ayahuasca vine and the leaves of the chacruna plant. Uh, but yahe uh, is made from the ayahuasca vine and the leaves of another vine Diplopteris cabrerana uh, which contain not only NNDMT which is the DMT that everybody's pretty much familiar with these days, but also 5-MeO DMT uh, and the Yahe experience, which I have, I have also had, uh, in my view, is more intense uh, and more powerful, almost to the point of being overwhelming, uh, than, the, than the ayahuasca experience. But, but what the, the result of this uh, sophisticated chemistry that we find taking place here uh, is, is uh, a brew which is hideous to drink it, 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 the taste uh, i find it quite repulsive um i almost wretched just uh, just smelling it in the in the cup mm -hmm. um but then unleashes these extraordinary experiences and it isn't just pretty visuals it's the sense of encounters with sentient others mm -hmm that there are sentient beings, that somehow we're surrounded by a realm of sentience that is not normally accessible to us. And that, that what the ayahuasca brew and certain other psychedelics, like, like some psilocybin mushrooms in a high enough dose can do it as well. LSD can do it, but ayahuasca is the master in this, of, of lowering the veil to what appears to be a seamlessly convincing other realm, other world. And of course, the hardline rational scientists will say that's just all fantasies of your brain. Um, but I don't think we fully understand or even close to understanding exactly what consciousness is. And I remain open to two possibilities, that consciousness is generated by the brain, is made by the brain in the way that a factory makes cars. Uh, but I also am open to the possibility that the brain is a receiver of consciousness, just as a television set is the receiver of television signals. Um, and and um, that, if that is, if that is the case, then we locked into the physical realm, we need our everyday alert problem-solving state of consciousness. And that's the state of consciousness that Western civilization values and, 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 and highly encourages. Uh, but these other states of consciousness that allow us to access alternative realities are possibly more important. It may be apocryphal, uh, but it was reported uh, after Francis Crick's role and his Nobel Prize for the discovery of the double helix that he finally got it under the influence of LSD. There's the classic example of Kerry Mullis and the polymerase chain reaction. He said he got that under the influence of LSD 
So the notion that the alert problem-solving state of consciousness is the only valuable state of consciousness is disproved by a, a, a valuable experiences that people have had in, in a visionary state. And, but the question that remains unresolved is those entities that we encounter, in the, and not everybody encounters them, and you're certainly not going to encounter them on every ayahuasca trip. There are ayahuasca journeys where nothing seems to happen. Um, I suspect something does happen, but it happens at a subconscious level. I know that shamans in the Amazon regard those trips where actually you don't see visions as amongst the most valuable. And they say you are learning stuff that you're not remembering, but you're learning it, you're learning it anyway. Um, these sentient others that are encountered, what are they? You know, are they just figments of our brain on drugs? Or are we actually gaining access to a parallel reality where, which is inhabited by consciousness, which is in non, a non-physical form? Uh, and, and I'm equally open to that idea. I think that may be maybe what is going on here with, with ayahuasca. But the other thing is that there is a presence within the ayahuasca brew, and she is present both, present both in ayahuasca and in yahe. And that's one of the reasons why the shamans say that that actually the master of the process is the ayahuasca vine, not the leaves. It's as though the vine has harnessed the leaves to gain access to human consciousness. And there, if you have sufficient exposure to ayahuasca or yahe, you drink it enough times. I've had maybe 75 or 80 journeys with, with ayahuasca. Uh, you, you definitely start to feel an intelligent presence with a definite personality, which I interpret as feminine and which most people in the West interpreted as feminine and they call her Mother Ayahuasca. There are some tribes in the Amazon who interpret the spirit of Ayahuasca as male, uh, but in all cases, that spirit is seen as a teacher. Uh, that's fundamentally what Ayahuasca is. It's a teacher and it teaches moral lessons. And that's fascinating that a mixture of two plants should cause us to reflect on our own behavior and how it may have hurt and damaged and affected others and fill us with a, a powerful wish not to repeat that negative behavior again in the future. Uh, you, the more baggage you carry in your life, the part of the beating that ayahuasca is going to give you until it forces you to confront and take responsibility for your own behavior. Uh, and, and that is a, that is an extraordinary thing to come from a, from a, pl a plant brew in that way. And I think in, in yes, the, I, I think ayahuasca is the most powerful of all the plant medicines uh, for accessing these mysterious realms. But there's no doubt you can access them. They're, they're all tryptamines. They're all related to one another in, in one way. You can access them through LSD, and you certainly can access them through psilocybin mushrooms as well in large enough dose. Both possibilities, as you describe, are interesting. And to me, they're kind of akin to each other. Uh, just, I wonder what the the limit of the brain's capacity is to create imaginary worlds and treat them seriously and make them real. And in those worlds, explore and have real sort of moral, deep brainstorming sessions mm. uh, up with those entities. So it's almost like the power of the human mind to imagine taken to its limit. Mm, it is. Um, and the curious thing is that the same iconography, uh, people paint their visions after ayahuasca sessions. People were painting in Europe, in the cave of Lascaux, for example, and of course they had access to psilocybin mushrooms uh, in prehistoric Europe. Uh, there's a remarkable commonality in the imagery that is that is painted. I, I uh, I like to give credit where credit is due, and there are two names that need to be mentioned here. One is the late, great Terence McKenna and his book, Food of the Gods, where he proposed the idea very strongly that it was our ancestral encounters with psychedelics that made us fully human. That's, that's what switched on the modern human mind. And very much the same idea began to be explored a bit earlier by Professor David Lewis Williams at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. Fabulous book called The Mind in the Cave, uh, where, where he is again arguing that these astonishing similarities in, in cave art and rock art all around the world can only be properly explained by people in deeply altered states of consciousness attempting to remember 
when they return to a normal everyday state of consciousness, in temp attempting to remember their visions and document them uh, on permanent media like the like the wall of a cave. So typically you get a lot of geometric patterns, but you also got entities. And those entities often are therianthropes, part animal, part human in form, might have the head of a wolf and the body of a human being, uh, might have the head of a bird and the body of a human being, and so on and so forth, and that they communicate with us in the visionary state. Interestingly, although this sounds like woo-woo, and it is an area that most scientists would steer clear of at risk of their careers, there is very serious work now being done at Imperial College in London and at the University of California at San Diego where volunteers are being given extended DMT. There's a new technology, uh, DMTX, uh, where the DMT is fed directly into the bloodstream by drip. And it's possible to keep the individual in the peak DMT state, uh, which normally when you smoke or vape DMT, you're looking, if you're lucky, at 10 minutes. Or if you're unlucky, if it's a bad journey, because those 10 minutes can seem like forever. Um, but uh, with DMTX, with the drip feeding of DMT into the bloodstream, these volunteers actually could be kept in the peak state uh, for hours. And unlike LSD, where you rapidly build up tolerance, nobody ever builds up tolerance to DMT. It always hits you with the same power. Even if you took it yesterday and the day before, and you're taking it tomorrow as well, it's still going to have that same power. There's no tolerance there. So that's how they can they can use that lack of tolerance to to keep volunteers in this state. And then when they debrief those volunteers, they're also putting them in MRI scanners and looking at what's happening in the brain. But when they debrief them, they're all talking about encounters with sentient others. There's even a group now called Sentient Others where people are exchanging, volunteers are, are now exchanging their experiences. They didn't do, they weren't allowed to do so at the beginning of the experiment, but now that most of them have left it, they're exchanging their experiences. And it's all about encounters with sentient others who wish to teach them moral lessons. Now, uh, to me, that's wild. What, what is going on here? Uh, what, 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 how do we account for this? Yeah, I get the notion of hallucinations and brightly colored visuals, but the moral lessons that come with it, th those are very odd. Yeah, and would you say that the reason that could give birth to a civilization is it because the such visions can help create myths, and especially like religious myths, that would be a cohesive thing for a large group of people to yes. get around. Yeah, and can help us to be better members of our own community. Right, with moral lessons. Yeah, more contributing members of our community, uh, more caring, more nurturing members of our community. That's got to be good for, for, for any community. I, I'm on, I've said this a dozen times, but uh, I'll say it again. If, if I had the power to do so, I would make it a law an absolute law that anybody running for a powerful political position, particularly if that position is president or head of state in any kind of way, that that person has to undergo the ayahuasca ordeal first. They have to have 10 or 12 sessions of ayahuasca uh, as a condition for applying for the job. Uh, I suspect that most who had had those experiences wouldn't want to apply for the job anymore. They would want to live a different kind of life. And those who did want to carry on being a leader of a nation would be very different people from the people who are leading the nations of the earth into chaos and destruction today. Yeah, they would be doing it for the right reasons. I mentioned to you, I recently interviewed Donald Trump and I actually brought up this same uh, same idea that uh, it would be a much better world if most of Congress and most po politicians would take some form of psychedelic yeah. at the very least. I have no doubt that it would be a better world. I mean, this raises an interesting point, which is the role of government in controlling our consciousness. Uh, and in my opinion, the, the, the so-called war on drugs is one of the fundamental abuses of human rights that have been undertaken in the past, in the past 60 years. Uh, it should be a Republican issue. If I understand the Republican Party correctly, the Republican Party believes in individual freedom for adults as much as possible, uh, and particularly the freedom to make choices over their own bodies. Uh, but 
in the case of even cannabis, I know this is one of the great things that's happening in America. It's it's happening state by state where cannabis is being is being legalized, and that draconian hand of government is being taken off the back of people who are who are consuming a medicine that is far less harmful than alcohol, which is glorified uh, in in our society. Um, we cannot say that we are free if we allow a government to dictate to us what experiences we may or may not have in our inner consciousness while doing no harm to others. And the point there is, we already have a whole raft of laws that deal with us when we do harm to others. Do we really need laws that tell us what we may and may or may not experience in the inner sanctum of our own consciousness? I think it's a fundamental violation of adult sovereignty. Uh, and we would have much less drug problems if these drugs were all legalized and made available to people without shaming them, without, without punishing them in any way, but just part of normal social life. And then you could be sure that you were getting good product rather than really shitty product, which has been cut with all sorts of other things. Ultimately, the way forward is for adults to take responsibility for their own behavior and for society to allow that to happen and not to have big government taking responsibility for decisions that should be in the hands of individuals. And for me also, it's exciting. Some of these uh, substances like psilocybin are, are uh, being integrated into scientific studies, large scales. It's really interesting. We've seen a revolution in, in the way science looks at psychedelics in the last 20, 25 years. Um, they, they were in that highly demonized category. But again, it's one of those paradigms which gets overwhelmed by new evidence. And it began to be realized that, that uh, psilocybin and, and other psychedelics are very helpful in a range of conditions from which people people suffer post-traumatic stress disorder uh, the fear of death when you're when you're suffering from terminal cancer can be overwhelming and it's been found that 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 uh, psilocybin can can remove that uh, deep depressions can be evaporated with one single massive psilocybin journey. They just go away. There's really good science on this, and, and they are being integrated into conventional medicine more and more. We'll see it happening. I'm not sure if it'll happen as much as, as fast as I would like to see it happen in my lifetime, but it is gonna happen. Yeah, I actually uh, just recently found out that you had a TED Talk, War on Consciousness. Yes. That uh, was taken down. Yeah. And that was just part of just the, the general resistance, because it was, it was a pretty, it wasn't a radical. It no, wasn't really I, a radical. I, I, I was talking about ayahuasca, and yeah. I was talking about the view that I hold very strongly that as long as we do no harm to others, sovereign yeah. adults should be allowed to make decisions about their own bodies and not face a jail sentence or or shaming as a result. But this, so it was a TEDx talk, not a TED talk, organized by a local TED. TED group, they call them TEDx talks, um, and uh, I, I gave this I gave this talk about the war on consciousness, and it was immediately pulled down from TED's main channel uh, with all kinds of bizarre reasons being given. But unfortunately, it was too late because a number of people had already downloaded the talk and then uploaded it onto other YouTube channels. And actually, their banning of it made it go viral uh, in a way that would not have would not have happened otherwise. But again, it's a sign that that points of view that are not acceptable to those in positions of power uh, are simply dismissed and shut down, uh, or at least attempts are made to to do so. In general, just along that line of thinking, I'm pretty sure that what we understand about consciousness today will seem silly uh, to humans from a hundred years from now. You bet it will, uh, especially if we harness psychedelics to investigate consciousness, and and uh, you know that is that is what is happening at uh, at Imperial College right now is is the investigation of the experience. They're not looking. There are other trials that are looking for the therapeutic potential of DMT, but in this case, they're looking entirely at the experiences that people have and why they're so. Similar similar from people from different age groups and different genders and different parts of the world are all having the same experiences.